born in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. Harvard Law School graduate. Yeah, I joined Columbia Records in 1960 as a contract lawyer. I couldn't introduce my godfather no better way. Godfather, Mr. Clive Davis. How are you, godfather? Oh, Clive, I'm great. I'm great because I'm here with you. And um, I'm looking forward to our talking today. Well, first of all, I I'm real excited because, you know, coming up in the industry and growing up in Haiti, right? And then coming to America, my father was a minister and, you know, circular music in the church. So basically we used to have to like to sneak to go to the clubs and play music because, you know, they would call it devil music. This is the devil's music. And he always say you couldn't serve two masters because the music industry is so evil. And all I gotta do is tell you when I got with you, Clive, it just normalized everything for me because I actually found somebody that actually care about the artists. So I just wanted to start off by saying thank you to you. That was very special. Thank you. Thank you for that. And last time we talked, of course, was on Pride Month, which was, I had an incredible time. Out of nowhere, Carlos Santana jumps on this Zoom and starts going crazy, which I loved. Uh, that was definitely quite amazing. I, I wanted off to start by asking you um, a question. Growing up in Brooklyn, like, because, man, I I'm telling you, like, when I came to Brooklyn, it was like nuts. What, what was that? Because they always say when people come from Brooklyn, there's a whole tenacity about them. Um, what was life like in Brooklyn? Can you break that down for me, Godfather? You know, growing up in Brooklyn um, has been, in many ways, very important for my life. Number one, it was a melting pot so that although my neighborhood was predominantly Jewish, there were enough immigrants, if you will, from Ireland, from Italy. There was enough from the Caribbean from, so that um, I really felt that I was not outside of where life was centering. It was very much uh, a melting pot of religions, races, colors. Um, so that socially served me well. Um, I was a student from the beginning of my school. Uh, loved reading, loved academics. But the best advice I ever got was from my mother. Because my mother said, you know, school, learning, education, rise above. My father was an electrician. And neither he nor my mother, nor anybody in their family had gone to college. But when, where I grew up, to rise above the station of your parents, they were all working class there. You either became a doctor or a lawyer, and school was very important. But my mother said to me, you know, don't go in at any kind of ivory tower. It's great, and you're an A student, it's great. But you gotta learn people. You gotta mix with people. You gotta get out there, and that's how you get common sense that's how you get relationships with people. You don't want to be in an ivory tower. So Clef, I was out there playing stickball, playing touch football. Wow. Uh, meeting all my peers, being grounded in sports, athletics, live six blocks from Ebbets Field. Yeah. I became a rabid Brooklyn Dodger fan. <laughs> In those days, the season was Brooklyn 154 Dodgers. games. Mm -hmm. I was allowed to see 22 maximum. In uh, the bleachers, 50 mm -hmm. cents. 
And the other thing that's very key is that the public school 161 in Crown Heights that I went to, followed by Erasmus Hall High School, so grounded me in what they called the minimum essentials of math, grammar, spelling, that it served me that way in such a special way all of my life. Um, and I'm so indebted to Brooklyn, so indebted for every aspect, so that although I was to go to NYU and to go to Harvard Law, my parents died when I was a freshman in college, unrelated to each other. So in effect, I was often, orphaned when I was 18. And I lived by scholarship. So the grades, the study of academics, the love of reading paid off. But when I got the offer, and I'm going fast forward, I'll go back and forth as you no see No problem, that. You, know, you know I love hearing you but, talk. But when I, just to bring this in a practical way, when I was at this law firm for three years, I got an offer unsolicited from the chief attorney for Columbia Records, a client of the firm. Mm -hmm. And he said, if you left, if you leave now, within a year, I'm going to become head of international for Columbia. We're going to set up companies in England and France. And I don't have a backup here sufficient, but within a year, you'll be head attorney. So I went to the senior attorney of this law firm. I was in a great law firm. Sam Roseman was the lawyer for Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman. Ralph Cohen represented CBS, Columbia Records, Bill Paley. So I went to Ralph Cohen and I said, look, I've got this offer that sounds great. And I described it to him. And as your dad told you, Ralph Cohen said to me, you don't want the record business. Mm -hmm. They are street guys. Most of them have gold chains. They're jazzy. <laughs> Look at you in your khaki pants and tweed sport jacket coming from Harvard. You come from a totally different place than the record business. And of course, I took the advice politely. It was certainly well-intentioned. The reason I bring it up is that I knew that notwithstanding the education that I had at Harvard, notwithstanding my khaki pants and tweed sport jacket, that I grew up on the streets of Brooklyn, melting pot, um, friendly with every race, color, and creed and that the advice my mother had given me to get out and meet people. I knew the common person. I didn't just know the gentilian law student at Harvard. And so that brings it full circle as to why I treasure my upbringing, my education uh, in Brooklyn. Wow, I mean, you know what's crazy is when you say Erasmus High School, all of my cousins went to Erasmus High School. Erasmus was literally a transition to me going to New Jersey. Um, that's, yes. defini that's definitely pretty amazing. For me, like, Brooklyn has changed. I've watched it constantly change. One of the things that I loved about Brooklyn that you said was the actual melting pot idea. And you know, like similar to you as an immigrant, like when I came in, Brooklyn was just 
it was, in, in my era, it was really, really bad. There was um, Flatbush Avenue. There was a small gang. It's so funny, because when you say like chains and everything, right? So like, yo, you don't want to get in this business, right? But you from Brooklyn, you good. It was a small gang called the Decepticons when I first came to Brooklyn. And I barely could speak English. And uh, my dad bought me four pair of sneakers. So I literally thought I was rich when I got to America. Each was $1.99 from a store called Jack's, $1.99. Um, at the time, the sneakers were called Jeepers. And, um, and then later, I got a, what was called my first Pumas, you know, and in the hood, getting a pair of Pumas, you have your toothbrush that somebody steps on you, you know, you clean it. And I literally, one of these kids came and he was sizing up, putting his foot like next to my foot. And I'm like, dang, people in America are so friendly. And so he's sizing his foot up next to my foot. I'm like, man, this guy is really, so I'm like, hey, how are you? My name is Nell, you know, so good. And next thing you know, he hits me with a right punch and I fall down and he takes my puma, um, the puma I had on my right foot. And, uh, and, I, and, and I was like holding down my left foot so he couldn't grab that puma. And now I get home and I'm with one pair of sneakers on. And I go to my immigrant home and my father look at me, he said, where your sneaker boy? And I said, dad, you wouldn't believe it, you know, there's this, um, some guy, you know, he looked like he was sizing me up. I thought he liked my, my, um, my sneakers. And then all of a sudden he punched me in my face and knocked me out. My father said, Welcome to Brooklyn. Now go back out there and get your sneakers and bring your sneaker back home. So <laughs> it was like my experience, my first experience in Brooklyn was like, yo, no matter what, you gotta be tough and you can't, be, you can't fear nothing. So um, shout out to this Decepticon gang. I never got that pair of sneakers back, but I gotta tell you, after that experience in Brooklyn, Godfather, I ain't never get a pair of sneakers taken, ever. So, you know, okay. I, I, I'm looking at you and I'm seeing my father's funeral. Newark, New Jersey. I'm up in the hood. My daddy, you know, I always go back to my parents. And my dad was a minister, so he believed in putting churches in the hood. And I remember at the funeral, you coming in. And I gotta tell you, that touched me a lot. You was wearing a white suit. I'll never forget that. Incredible coming in. The reason why I mention that is because me and Whitney share a certain connection that I share with Whitney Houston. And I think the idea of coming from the church, that bishop, that whole energy was um, something quite amazing for me. And I mention that because every time I come to see you, there's the way that you talk about Whitney Houston, you know, is I think it's so important that we, in history, that people understand um, where, you, where you found Whitney and who is Whitney like to the world, like in your mind, Godfather, Whitney Houston. You know, you're asking the question probably the right day. Why is it the right day? Because today is really the first day, Clef, that we're going to all the motion picture studios uh, and streaming services with the biopic of Whitney. Wow. And uh, so the background here is that, yes, in my heart, I I'm the guardian of the legacy of Whitney. And never will it be my intention to soft pedal uh, anything about her life, whitewash it, the lethal addiction to drugs, which ended up doing her in. But when I say the guardian, without sounding pompous, arrogant, or presumptuous, there was the full side of Whitney, having signed her when she was 18, going on 19, knowing her from a teenager, forward. 
The full story of her life has never been told in the two documentaries that have come out. The first one was absurd, inaccurate, not factual, sensationalistic. Um, the second one, the director just did not know music, bowed out. So any interview with me was never used, never met with you or Babyface, David Foster, mm -hmm. the whole musical side, other than how many records she broke, mm -hmm. was left out. So you don't have the full picture of Whitney. You don't have the other side of Whitney. And so I, I would say a little over a year ago, um, after Bohemian Rhapsody came out, A, I was impressed with the creative work done, the writer Anthony McCartan, mm -hmm. and of course, historically, it's now become the biggest music film of all time, just shy worldwide of a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. And so I met with Anthony, bonded with Anthony, and he and I agreed with the estate to co-produce the biopic of Whitney. And I've worked with Anthony, making sure that he uh, has done substantial research um, and gone over different evolutions of the script. So we now have the full script, which I'm very happy with. Mm -hmm. And of course, music will co-star, not just the records that have come out, not just the movies, Bodyguard, Waiting to Exhale, Preacher's Wife that had come out, but you know all the private events. Yes. You know my Grammy party every year. You know if I were being honored by a, a well-intentioned, achieving charity, Whitney was always there for me. Yes. So we have the private performances of Whitney um, that no one has ever seen. It's not a documentary, it'll be a film. Mm -hmm. But no matter who is cast, no casting yet, mm -hmm. it will be the voice of Whitney Hearn. But it will be vo the voice, um, you know, not necessarily heard before on record mm -hmm. um, to compliment, of course, all that was released great in record. So I made sure that um, Hopefully, she'll be understood, you know, that throughout life, she was looking for a marriage, kids, family that would be normal, notwithstanding the incredible career that she had. It was never to be hers, um, either from childhood or through her life. But music, indeed, was so part of her DNA. Uh, and you learn to understand that. Uh, so it's a propitious day today, because we're just out there, and we'll see where it goes. Wow, that's going to be amazing. You've heard it first on Run That Back. Um, wow. You know, it's so crazy because I remember being on the phone with you and you like, yo, I need this song for Whitney Houston. And I guess for me, when you sang like family, I just remember being in the studio with her, her daughter and Bobby Brown. And that session, it was just so much love like going on when she was singing, my love is your love. And, um, and I saw Bobby like, singing along with her. So I was like, Bobby, go in the booth. And Bobby Brown sung a little bit of the hook. I just tucked it in. But I know with your ears, you can hear everything. So all good. <laughs> so I look forward to that. I know that's going to be really, really amazing. So before I let you go, you know, rappers constantly bragging about what they do, when they do it, whatever. 
Yo, dog, if you was to start to, if we was to start to talk about who you are and what you've done, all I could do is tell everybody that's listening, please, we all have to watch your Netflix documentary like three trillion times. Now, let me tell you, everyone could watch it and we could see the accolades, but the most amazing part about you, Godfather, that attracts me, that keeps me going, is the idea of falling. Falling is like a transition for you. Like any, it's like you constantly rise to the occasion at the highest level. So, you know, at times when we fall, we feel like we can't get back up. And when we see like what you do, you constantly like keep going and you give us that energy. So if you was to give us that, what is that magic potion to keep going? Like at times when you feel like all roads are the end, like it just feels totally fucked up, like you can't go. I mean, all the way to the point where Godfather, like one of my friends was Tim Avicii. And I remember, you know, going to Sweden, seeing him, and having that success at a young age, you know, and then automatically feeling like life is too much, the industry is too much, and that pressure pulls us in. And he takes his own life. And the idea of depression is a very serious one. What advice would you give all of us, you know what I'm saying, like moving forward? Advice requires a, a certain amount of belief in yourself a certain amount of understanding that what you're fighting for is not only your survival, but that right is on your side. Um, a terrible way for me to have equipped myself um, for the perils of life, for surviving unexpected crises, and I don't know if anybody escapes unexpected crises. Uh, that's not what life for everyone is about. So losing your parents when you were a teenager, and when I went to law school, you know, that's when I felt my loneliest. That's when I felt my most anxious without the parental love support to be there. And so that surviving that um, on $4,000 to my name after both parents had passed away um, prepares you for a certain amount of rough going. And in my case, yes, as my documentary on Netflix, and I guess that's why it's gone viral. They just tell me it's exploded. Talk, talk, Clive, talk. Let them know. All over the world. Facts. And, uh, it is seen. And so that, you know, in the midst of all the artists, Clef, you know I signed before we met, whether it's yeah. Springsteen or Joplin or Santana or Earth, Wind and Fire, Aerosmith. Um, Alicia Keys, and Hug Love Philadelphia Daddy. No, 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 before that. Yeah, I know. And then <laughs> there was a crisis at CBS. I was fired. Mm -hmm. um, but because they didn't know whether there was any payola in the record industry. So mm -hmm. here, notwithstanding unequal success, mm -hmm. I had to wait for, you know, vindication. That was tough. Yeah. And starting from scratch with Arista, after Columbia, uh, when you're the biggest company, I've taken them from three, number third largest company to number one. And starting from scratch, but then instead of signing self-contained rock acts, like those that I mentioned, I then had to hone my ear to hit songs because by that time the rock was new wave. And although mm -hmm. I re-signed the Kinks and brought in the Grateful Dead and signed Patti Smith and 
um, the Outlaws and um, Lou Reed, they don't give you the volume mm -hmm. that you want. I wanted to have the number one company, major. And so you do that from knowing what a hit song is. And it was knowing and feeling and learning I had a natural gift that led me to the signing of Barry Manilow, finding Mandy for him, even though he could write it. We shared it over the years. He wrote, I found trying to get the feeling weekend in New England. I write the songs. And that led me to Dion Warwick, bringing her back. I'll never love this way again. Deja vu, heartbreaker. Mm -hmm. That's what friends are for. Mm -hmm. That brought me to Aretha. She was no longer, she was always the queen of soul. Mm -hmm. But Aretha, after Jerry Wexler, and she were no longer collaborators, she needed someone to work with her to find those hit songs. And she was approaching 40. And such a thrill for me with an artist like Aretha, that whether it was jump to it, get it right, a rose is still a rose. Mm -hmm. I knew you were waiting for me. Sisters are doing it for themselves. Freeway of love. I mean, we had hit after hit. She won Grammy Award after Grammy Award until the time that she passed. Uh, that, of course, after the signing of Aretha, I signed Whitney. And those songs, you know, that document her life. And you came in so specially, Clef, because she had not done a studio album in eight years. We had had three albums she broke every record in history, seven yeah. consecutive number ones. And then she did movies, successful, obviously, Bodyguard, the most successful soundtrack yeah. of all time. Yeah. Waiting Texel, 15 million, huge album moving. Um, but she had not done a studio album for eight years. So when she went into the studio with you, nervous, not because of you, but nervous that she had not done a studio album in eight yeah. years. Yeah. And what you did with My Love Is Your Love, you know, and then we had It Isn't, It's Not Right, But It's Okay. And That's right. Other hits. That was so major. And so that, and my second signing of Santana, uh, and I hadn't seen him work with him 25 years. And we went in the studio. Supernatural, the 12th biggest selling album of all time was the result. And you were there with those, one of the two big, big, big hits that led to this incredible milestone. You came with Maria Maria. <laughs> so our lives into Twine Club, um, we met at an important time for each of us and we built our own uh, friendship and bond uh, and special uh, connection. So that ties it all together where yes, adversity comes, um, I had two of those, and your question, you just stiffen that spine. You never think of stopping. No one's going to stop you from doing what you love. No one's going to interrupt the uh, joy, the passion of music, and you're both inspiring artists, producers, musicians, and you win out. You know, so what do I tell you, listeners? First of all, sharpen that work ethic. Make sure that you never float. Take for granted. Be confident. For me, no one plays my records ever because I signed Joplin, Springsteen, and Whitney Houston. You got to prove it every time out. 
So I have a great respect for failure. And those cocky individuals that rest on their laurels, that's ill-advised. You gotta come from a position of belief, knowing that you gotta attention to detail, work ethic, and believe that right will win out when it comes to personal character and life. Godfather, it was such a pleasure. You know, I could talk to you all day. You look good. And dude, like, dude, tell me, what do you have, do you have a rest day? Like, what's a chill day for you, man? Like, is this a chill day? What, what's the chill day? Well, it doesn't, well, it's today. I'm talking to you. So you're chilling today. But you're I enjoy it. I'm not chilling, but um, I'm a great believer in family. Yeah. I've got four kids. I've got yeah. eight grandkids. Yes. So that I make time for the priority of my kids, um, for life together. I also make time for travel. So many people we know can get myopic thinking, oh, America has it all. But until you go travel in the world, until you go see Talk. and eat in Capri and the Amalfi Coast, uh, uh, until you um, go to whether it be Africa or Asia or Latin America or the Caribbean, learn other cultures, benefit from the wisdom that each has that has contributed to, to the world. So I love to travel. I'm a foodie. I like great restaurants um, and um, living life. Yes. That's that's the vibe. Well, Godfather, I thank you. You know how you inspire me. So like we say, run that back. This is my Godfather, the great Clive Davis. I love you. Okay, great. Sending love to you too, Clive. Thank you. Bye-bye. So this next artist, Jeremy Torres, is, of course, by way of Puerto Rico, but lives in New York City. We connected because you're like 22, 23, and you're talking about, you know, Bob Dylan is like your favorite artist, you know, Jimi Hendrix. And I'm like, dude, like, you're pretty young. And what I'm amazed by him so as someone from Haiti, you know, I'm inspired by Cuba, DR, Puerto Rico, the entire Caribbean, of course, by way of Africa. Like, I draw my inspirations. Then when I started going to Europe, you could forget about it, you know? Um, I remember I used to call Avicii, real name Tim, I used to be like, yo, you, you, got that, you got that Nordic scale, you know what I mean? That Viking scale, I'm about to grab that. So literally you're going around the world and you're like picking up energy. And this kid, Jeremy Torres, I've done a lot of work in the Latin market. Like, originally, like, you know, I was one of the people that helped bring some form of commercialism in that space. Y'all know that's the real, all the way back to Evie Queen. I remember when I did Guantanamo, that I was like, yo, that ain't gonna be on no radio that play English music. I'm like, yeah, it actually can. So. What I love about Jeremy Torres is amongst this Latin sensation that we're in, he's singing and the language do not matter. When I tell you it don't matter, you are about to learn Spanish 101 on a level that you've never heard it on. Um, and I love the fact that he plays multiple instruments. And of course he's a little bit older, but I remember when I first met like Justin Bieber, it was like, yo, uh, Mr. Wyclef Jean, can you uh, can you give me a shout out for my Facebook? You know, um, he was he's gifted, and I love the fact that he could go from instruments to instruments and sing and play. And this kid Jeremy got that um, on a different level. I felt that his energy was strong. He not only he reminded me of me, but he we also connected because you know, like he got one brother that's 
that's in a penitentiary right now that's coming home. Um, and, you know, he's from like, he's not from an easy background. And then he rises to the occasion and he constantly speaks of the spirit of his mom. You know what I mean? So I love that. He's definitely grounded. The music is sexy though. I can't even lie, man. Let's get into this Jeremy Torres, Enamorados. Es que yo sigo enamorado, enamorado de ti. No dejo de pensar en ti, bebé, mi bebé. Es que sigo enamorado, enamorado de ti. No dejo de pensar en ti. Chief the right, the heart will flicker, Stephen King. Clean the fox, all the things I say. I got tired of the fat lady, so I sing to my own opera. Ballin', 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 to the man in Rock and Island. Hi, White Clef. Hey, do you me? Um, what's up? How Why you, you hit me today? with that Hi, White Clef? Let me let the audience know what happened before Hi, White Clef. I start every segment with Hi, White Clef. All right, before Hi, White Clef, we was off cam, and I was like, yo, y'all know it's heavy election season, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And Madeline was like, are you trying to influence my questions? I was like, look, the reason why this show works is because you are pop culture. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and because you don't get to know what we're going to get into right, beforehand. Right. That is yes. why it works. But hopefully you won't mind today's topic. Uh, uh. It's about something that you have coming up soon that I personally am very excited about. But oh. I, I have to start by making an admission that I have made to you. Uh, and I think people will be very surprised by because of the amount of time I've worked with you. Okay. Okay. Sure. So, you know, when the score came out, I, like, it looks like everyone in the world was a huge fan of the score. And then, and then the Fugees broke up. <laughs> okay, <laughs> clarification. Um, if you watch the five heartbeats, yeah, when the five heartbeats break up, yeah, they tell you that they are broken up. Yes. So just want to clarify. I'll take that within clarification. the course of history, mm. from the beginning of time, I have never heard one Fuji <gasps> member thus. That is true. So far, that I'm just true. saying. So. I just wanted to so clarify. Let me put it this way. I just wanted to clarify <laughs> my Jesse Jackson theory <laughs> of keep hope alive. <laughs> so the Fuji's didn't break up, guys. <laughs> However, there was not a next Fuji's album. Mm -hmm. What did happen next was an album called Why Clef Sean Presents the Carnival with the Refugee All-Stars. Did I get the title right? Yes, that's for sure. Okay. What also happened is that I never heard that album. I did not hear the Carnival album until I started working with you five years ago. Now, people have taken me to task about that. People have explained to me why this album is so important. People have told me how this album got them through certain points of their high school or college life. It definitely Literally was how a they couldn't dorm. have survived without this yeah, album. The carnival was definitely a college dorm, you know, must have. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, that's, that's like, what I've been told. It, yeah, it's that album that went with your choice of Kush. Choice yeah. of Kush. Yeah, your preference oh, okay, of okay, strain. Okay. You know what this I mean? This was a great album to get high to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <laughs> that might be why I wasn't listening to the carnival. <laughs> but the truth is, I really did not understand yet you as an artist and producer separate of the group. But, but I was listening to all of these other songs that you were writing and producing for 
Destiny's Child, Carlos Santana, Whitney Houston, Shakira. So I was hearing all of this and still never heard the Carnival album. Cool. Right? Okay, so another important piece about that time in history is that at that time, relevant to what I'm about to talk to, get into with you. Mm -hmm. At that time, I was years into working um, on a show called It's Showtime at the Apollo. When you were still a Fuji, Fuji's appeared on a Showtime at the Apollo. I had a fierce fight with the people, other people that worked with me at Showtime at the Apollo because Fuji's refused to come on unless they could actually play their instruments on stage. And I really, really believed in the group and thought the group should be on and should be able to play their instruments. That ended up being one of the highest rated episodes ever of Showtime at the Apollo and highest rated rerun of a episode of a Showtime at the Apollo. So now, fast forward to today. That was 24 years ago. Damn, it felt like 24 days ago, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, 24 years ago. You are about to do something on stage at the Apollo that is gonna be live streamed everywhere that you have never done. You're about to perform the whole Carnival album from beginning to end. Like, in sequence of the album. Now being someone who can relate to all those people, <laughs> the millions upon millions of people who obsess over that album still, I get it. I am, I think, as excited as everybody else probably is about this happening. So what I want to get into is the mind of Wyclef when he was making the Carnival album. I, I want to know what made that album such a cult classic? What made it so important to people? I, I want to I wanna hear about the making of the carnival. Let's well, get into it. Well, I think, like, for me, if you come to my house, right, because we at the mm -hmm. crib mm -hmm. at a certain part, and I told y'all, don't try to Google map this and try to roll up on me. <laughs> you know what I mean? I got them things in the crib. <laughs> um, the carnival. Rah. So... They call me like a, a thug hippie, right? I only yeah. say that because if you in the crib, you see like I got equipment all over the place. There's studios, there's like yes. every room has like a speaker that goes with a recording. If I, a guitar, if I want to catch a vibe. Um, coming from the score, um, which was a big record, it was huge. And if you follow my career back then, mm -hmm. the producers was not that famous. Not so people all. wasn't like concerned about who was doing the records because all they had to do was read the, the credits. Yes. Yeah. And they'd be like, so for me, I had seen um, a thing on Wu-Tang Clan yeah. and the RZA. And I realized like how, how much like us like nerds I call us like thug nerds have in common because when I saw like, you know, how we go into music stores and we can't buy the piece of equipment, you know, and we play with it until they kick us out, you know what I'm yeah. saying to you? So I want you to understand, so the mind of a producer, I'm listening to like Pink Floyd, The Wall, you feel me? Um, and then one of my favorite rappers, people don't even know, is Coogee Rap. Mm -hmm. So. For me, it's like you listening to all this stuff, you do the score, the score explodes, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the score exploded in capacity that no one was expecting. So, you know, Including you're- Including you. Yeah, of course, like you're in your, because the reason why we didn't expect it, because the first album was called Blunted on Reality. And, and it went copper, sorry. Yeah, it did. It, it went copper, but it makes me think of a lot of music that goes copper mm -hmm. for the time that it's being made, um, you'll be surprised. I could take you to Jimi Hendrix records. I could take you to Bob Marley oh, records. Yeah, I, I could take you. It's sort of like, so I wouldn't define anything as copper, maybe ahead of its time 
for for relevancy when people go back and they listen. Not many people bought it. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. We'll put it that so, way. So, yeah, semi-copper. So, <laughs> but think about that. That's an explosion. So it's like, where do you go from there? So I'm watching and I get this like little fear as a producer because as a producer and a composer, I'm like, holy sh like, where do you go from here? This yeah. is like, yeah. and you know, so I'm like, oh man, here we go. Like a band that sells a trillion copies and you never hear from them again. You know, VH1, where are they now? I'm like, where are we gonna yeah. go? So for me, I found my refuge in a producer and a composer uh -huh. because I felt like if I had to do the score too, there would be like mad stress, you know what I'm saying? Because you literally are like, okay, the first one did this amount, and you know, fans would be expecting a second one to, yeah. you, can, you can, can you imagine the peer yeah. pressure? So for me, it was like, the carnival was my escape as a composer and a producer. It was my space of art, like Basquiat. Yes. The painter. Yeah. To just say, right, because I couldn't speak in four languages or five languages on the score. It would have went over your head. Y'all be like, is he mixing, you know, Celia Cruz with beats? It would just would have been weird because it didn't exist. That's like, right. You That's know, right. you go back to the carnival, you hear all kind of beats. You hear compa, you hear Afro beats, you hear reggaeton, everything. So for me, I felt it like a escape haven. And it was like, I got a chance to express a piece of art that absolutely nobody was checking for. Mm -hmm. So when I was working on the carnival, I absolutely had not one blink of stress. I literally was, you know, I felt like some crazy scientist, you know what I'm saying? My beard growing out, you know, and I'm in this, and I'm trying to create something. I, I would say, the craziest thing about it was to present the album to my record company and to yeah. say, hey, so I'm, I have this album, y'all might want to listen to it. And you know, and then they heard this piece of art that was in like five languages. The carnival is literally like multi-language. It yeah. don't, yeah. nothing exists like that. So for me, um, that part was a bit challenging mm -hmm. because how, where the f Clef, okay, so Clef, you mean to tell me you just combined the Bee Gees mm -hmm. and, oh, Silly and if that's Cruz. not enough for you, you want to add the Philharmonic Orchestra, that ain't enough for you. You want to add Celia Cruz, mm -hmm. you want to add the Neville Brothers. Where are you going with this thing, bro? Like, just give us some basic hip hop, you know? And for me, I felt like hip hop's the culture. But right. within the culture, I felt like this piece of art was necessary. And right. when you listen to the carnival, what I was just going for was just unification. Mm -hmm. Like, cause you gotta understand, coming from Haiti where I come from, growing up in Brooklyn, moving to Jersey, when I tell you people got shot, people was trapping, mm -hmm. I've seen women go from prom queen to prom fiend. Mm -hmm. Like, it was, the era was so real, so for me, I was like, but we all have more in common than we might think. So what if I could create a piece of art where there would be no border? Like you ain't need no right. green card to get right. through here. You didn't need like, no, your entry was just like, you know, like in the beginning, yo, you know, welcome to the carnival. You know, your past is all love. If you got a place in your heart for love, come in here and you're gonna have a good time, you know? Yeah. So you always say that- um... And the drinks were free. <laughs> <laughs> You always say Gone Till November is the original trap song. Mm -hmm. So was it about a real person? Yeah. I mean, those that know me know I have two sides of my life, you know, and I, I'm never ashamed to say it. And like, at the end of the day, I mean, what do me and Frank Sinatra had in common? I mean, I really, my whole life, I've been surrounded by Gangsters. Yeah. But like real gangsters in the sense of these are just childhood friends we come up with. I didn't tell you drug dealers or because all the drug dealers I knew they worked for the gangsters. Mm -hmm. So 
all the way down to, you know, you know, I've had members of my family, like, you know, like the small village where we come from in Haiti, it ties with a lot of people, you know what I mean? So when yeah. you hear the score and you hear me say some, sometimes I mention something, we keep referring ourselves like as Haitian Sicilians, you know what I mean? It was like, not to say like Sicilian in that sense, it was just the come up of how we came up mm -hmm. was we landed in Coney Island, Brooklyn. You feel what I'm saying to you? Yeah. So this is really where we ended up. So for me, I just remember like it was just not, what we was doing was just not cool because you have to understand. So we called it fresh. You feel what I'm saying to you? So, and you know, Madeline, because you fresh and you've always been fresh. So for me, you know, like when I say on the score, I used to work at Burger King, a king taking orders. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of peer pressure on you as a young kid when you seeing your boys with all of this drip, icy, you know, the fly girls, you a teenager, you know, dude is barely 18, he's pulling up in the Maxima, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, going to November was, it's everything you hear as we detail it, it's for real, this is what happens. What happens is when you, those that understand the movement of how trap really works, mm -hmm. it's, when you don't wanna get caught, you literally are going to a virgin territory because you going somewhere where you know like you don't have to watch your back or your head, you go into a safe zone. And at the time, it looked like Baltimore was a safe zone. You see and, what I'm saying Virginia. to you? Virginia. Yeah, so, oh, who you knew be trapping in Virginia? <clears throat> All right, so, <laughs> so it was a safe zone at the time, but can you imagine what happens when someone makes the run and doesn't make it back? Right. And now the girl is waiting for them. Yeah. And I'm literally like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, when I say like gone to November, it's like, you know the person ain't coming back, but it's sort of like you have to give that sense of hope to yeah. their spouse. Like, you know, it's, gonna, it's going to be all right. You know what I'm yeah. saying to you? So, so in that sense, we don't sugarcoat it. Like the carnival, it just literally is like, a, it's a film. So we take you on this trip to Baltimore and do don't make it back. Do you know that every year, every single year, on November 1st, you trend on Twitter? <laughs> every, some of the funniest tweets I have ever seen. It's like, oh, it's November, is White Clef back? Yeah. Can somebody find White Clef? Yo, you know what's funny about that is so when you write a song, there's always a double entendre. Yeah. So I'm never here, like I'm going to November. So my girl is like, what? I'm going to November. Like I'm always on tour, I'm constantly gone. And when you hear this song, you know how a song becomes bigger than you and every individual has their own meaning of the song? Yeah. So I remember like being at the airport and dude pulls up, he has his two, um, two kids with him. And you could tell like they are from like the super hills of the suburbs, like super <laughs> high hills, because the whole accent came out. He was like, hey, why Clef John? He didn't even call me John. He was like, why Clef John? John. <laughs> hey, Timmy, come here, come here, Timmy. G. Come here, Timmy. Um, can you do that thing you do just one time? I'll be gone to November. Come on, T Timmy, listen, this guy's <laughs> great. You know, and I'm like, I'll be gone to November. I'll be gone. And Timmy's like, yeah, I love this song. And I'm like, man, they don't know this song is about drugs. At all. <laughs> not, not even at all. Mm -hmm. So, I, and I'm taking up a lot of time, but I have to ask this question too. Uh, what about the skits? The, oh. Because these weren't just interludes. These were like whole skits that actually stitched together if you pay attention, which yeah, I so, didn't at first. So, yeah, and a lot of people didn't. It went over their head. Mm -hmm. um, Album was a classic vibe, but the skits, I got a lot of flack for it from the beginning. Really? Because, yeah, because um, even like my record company, they wanted me to go straight to the songs. Right. Because at the right. time, no one was literally, as much effort as I put into the songs, Right. you know, I put into the skits. Because for me, that's how we used to communicate on the corner. Mm -hmm. You know, like I was just a storyteller. I'll sit there and tell you stories all day, you know, and the old heads, you know what I mean? You don't know nothing about no music, boy. So for me, the skits was important, but the skits was important in the sense of 
Do you see how today we're dealing with the immigration laws yes. and the policies and certain things we want changed? Yes. So when you go back, anyone now, when you listen to the carnival, when you listen to it, you're going to be like, holy shit. Like, this dude That's was true. talking about immigration and putting these policies like in place like ever since back then. And literally, like... When I did Guantanamera, I remember like us being upstairs and I remember who was downstairs, you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying to you? So for me, putting the skits together, you know, later, whether if it was Dave Chappelle, mm -hmm. Chris Rock, you know, I was seeing the reviews and a lot of like brilliant comedians, like they love the album and they love the skits, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. I had people like Talent, people like Will, just different like... Because I wanted, I love comedy so much um, that I was like, what happens if you could put comedy yeah. against like some heavy issues at times? Um, and that's how we did the carnival. And lots of artists afterwards started putting interludes on their album. Definitely. Well, once again, the interlude, right? They always say an idea comes from another idea. Mm -hmm. mm. And that other idea is great. Mm -hmm. But can you make it greater? And then can the next person even make it greater? Then yeah. We all are inspired by each other. So for me, it's Pink Floyd. Like, I keep going back. I'm like, yo, any dude that want to really, 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 really be like some out there type producer, yeah. like, where you just out the box, you're not worried about anything, and you want to put like a good, like, 35 years of music, and then... A thousand years, people could keep catching up. Pink Floyd. So for me, the way I used to hear these skits that they used to do, I used to be like, man, I, you actually could just put skits on on like on music. So then I, I more thought about like audio mm -hmm. movies. Mm -hmm. So all of my music that I do after listening to, I was they gotta be like audio films. Yeah. So um, that's how we came about that. Why, Clef? Thank you for schooling me on the carnival. And thank you for having me on another episode of Run That Back. Definitely. And the Apollo is going to be dope because um, my inspiration is like Herbie Hancock and Quincy Jones. So when y'all tune in, because we're not going to have an audience, we can't right. move around. It's going to be live stream. Live stream, but y'all going to get the experience of how these records were created. Because a lot of times you just hear it. Um, just make sure like you have your drink with you because <laughs> we are just going to like go in and have a great time. I love it. Every time I make a run, girl, you turn around and cry. I ask myself why, oh why. See, you must understand, I can't work no nine to five. So I'll be gone to November. Said I'll be gone to November, I'll be gone to November, yeah. Tell my girl I'll be gone to November, I'll be gone to November, I'll be gone to November, yeah. Tell my hustlers I'll be gone to November, January, February, March, April, May. See you're crying, but girl I can't see. I'll be gone to November, I'll be gone to no. Ay, 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 ay. Girl I got leave, please don't cry. When I come back, you know, limits the sky. I take you out to dinner to your favorite spot. Feed you an half a year just to get your high. Drive a movie by the cemetery. If my corpse can talk, then I would tell him I was sorry. Lifestyles of the rich and famous. Some die with the name, some die nameless. <laughs> Said I'll be gone to November, I'll be gone to November, yeah. Tell my girl I'll be gone to November, I'll be gone to November, I'll be gone to November, yeah. Tell my hustles I'll be gone to November. January, February, March, April, May. See you crying, my girl, I can't stay. I'll be gone to November, I'll be gone to no. Hey, hey, hey. You know, when I sit back here, I think like when we was in the hood, 
and Norg, and we used to say, yo, pour some liquor for my homies, you know? We still do that, but now, you know, we gonna toast up for one of, I mean, this guy's like, like when I say a mentor, he really mean a lot to me and have helped me a lot in my life. And I, I'm really happy to call him one of my godfathers, you know? So I raise a toast this time to the great Clive Davis. Thank you for everything. <laughs>